Hey, a couple of quick notes before we start the show. After we recorded this, a couple of things happened. First, New York City passed legislation to phase out using natural gas for heating and cooking in buildings in New York City. That's a big deal. That's kind of like a, a big city taking a big step forward and kind of setting the path for other states and cities to follow along. And Nicole, who is always the smartest person in the room, sent me a link to a ebook, Electrify Everything in Your Home. It's from rewiringamerica.org, a guide to comfy, healthy, carbon free living. And it's an ebook, rewiringamerica.org. Uh, I will also put the link in the show notes here. So here we go. Hey, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. Thanks for downloading the show. My name is Eric. I am your host. I have this YouTube channel. No, I have a YouTube channel and this podcast all about eclectic DIY is what I call it. Today, we're here with Nicole and Will to talk about converting a home from fossil fuels to electric. And is that a good thing and how to do it? So welcome, Nicole and Will. Hey, happy to be here. How's everybody doing today? We're good. So some background, uh, Nicole was just on the show talking about her electric car she just bought. Uh, Will and I have some experience with solar and electricity and Nicole has a grid tied solar system already. Um, so why don't you bring us up to speed and what prompted this whole thing, Nicole? Well, I mean, we got the electric car and then I've known for a while that we're going to have to give up this natural gas stove situation that we have. Mm -hmm. um, because I, as I've learned, we natural gas is methane. Let's just call it what it is. <laughs> we're always like changing names. So we're just burning methane in our homes to heat it. Right. So it may or may not be the cleanest option uh, so far as fossil fuels, but I need to get away from the fossil fuels. And I remember back in the day when people brought up solar stuff or electric, I was like, yeah, but you're burning carbon at the, you know, at, at the power station, except they have like scrubbers and they're much more efficient. <laughs> yes. Yes. So they that is the right scale. They have scale. So. We bought the electric car and then um, there was a great article I'll, I sent around that kind of has a list of the what are the next steps you take after you have solar panels, after you have an electric car, what, what else can you do to decrease your footprint? And so that the, the natural, um, the, the hot water heater is a natural cheapest next step, I would say. Yeah. So... And your eventual goal is to convert your whole house, including your furnace, to electric. Is that right? That is right. And I will say, Eric, you have inspired me. Um, I think your YouTube site, you've put in a couple HVACs down through the years. Is that right? No. <laughs> I, put the, I didn't make a video about it. I put them in my house. Okay. So some, either it was like watching your videos and it like spooled me off to somebody else. Or maybe it was cool tools, but I'm like, I bet I could do it myself. I can, I can put in my next age rack myself. <laughs> well, let's have Will come in because he can speak to that. What it, I, you know, we started with the conversation of going and doing the water heater and the electric, and then all of a sudden I ended up down this huge rabbit hole of doing calculations and math and bombarding you guys with all of this mathematics of how many kilowatts and what panel arrays and everything else, and then I kind of step back and went, wait, let's look at the greater picture of this of, you know, once you have the solar panels in place and everything going, it, it'll it eventually pay for itself and put it together. So it's not necessarily about the math in the beginning. It's about the end goal of what you're going for. So it was kind of an interesting experiment to dive into. So I'm, I'm glad you wrote me into this. So I and Nicole both have grid tied solar arrays on our house. Will, do you have a solar array? I do, um, but I use a consumption array on, I use it for utility purposes. So on buildings that I can't get electric to, I have what I call micro solar systems where they're completely enclosed on themselves. The energy that it's being produced is stored in batteries and then used in the building that it's it's being done in. So our, our piece is all about 
the consumption of what we're producing because quite honestly, not everywhere in the United States you can sell back to the power company. Uh, yep. In Wisconsin here, the power company that we're on does not have the ability to sell back uh, credit. So really there's not a big push right now for solar in our area unless you're using it to self-consume, which is what we do. And you have some great videos on the Weekend Homestead YouTube channel about, I think one, it's one of your big garages you uh, you solar powered and it's brilliantly simple. It's very easy to do. If you're, if anyone wants like a first baby step to moving towards solar. Well, the big but, one for us was trying to figure out a way to do it for under $600 yep. and it's Wisconsin winters, which means the building that it's in is not heated. And historically when it's 30 below outside, it's not necessarily good for lithium batteries. So we had to figure out a way to heat the batteries using the solar that we're producing and make sure that the heat consumption doesn't outrun the solar panels that we have on the buildings. So we run out of power. I love it. And then, Will, didn't you do your little outhouse too? Your little, what do you call it? The little cozy cabin? Yep. Pinecone Camp is also uh, completely uh, um, running on solar. And actually, since we've now updated some of our property and we've done some pretty major upgrades on the weekend homestead that hopefully I'll have up online. We've got the video shot. I just haven't edited it. But uh, Pinecone Camp is also going to get an upgrade here. We're taking all the solar stuff that we had in our pole barn and now actually applying it to the camp so we can get a little bit more efficient and a little bit uh, more of a breather room on the system that's out there. Nice. So going back to um, getting Nicole's home off of uh, propane, I mean, natural gas, I think the the would the next obvious steps be um, a heat pump house heating system and cooling system and then a heat pump domestic hot water heater? What do you think, Will? So I went through the math on both the water heater and actually I have some experience with like Mr. Cool DIY systems and heat pumps and splits and those types from some of the installs we've done at the resort. And the first red flag that always comes up in solar is the amount of energy that's consumed by a water heater. Like Nicole, I know you sent me your information about your solar panel systems, just using a domestic 30 gallon water heater actually would consume all of the power that you are currently producing with your solar panel systems that you'd produce in a day would be consumed by one device in the house just to heat hot water in the house. So then I kind of started going through and trying to figure out, are there more efficient ways? Could you use geothermal? Could you use, you know, wood? Could you use all sorts of different ways to kind of make it work? And that's really where the struggle comes in when you get into these larger appliances is you're probably going to have to double the number of panels so that you're selling back a significant number of credits to offset the devices that you're putting in the home. Could it be done? Now, Absolutely. One one thing with the new hot water heaters is many of them are smart, um, Wi-Fi enabled. And I think right now our hot water heater is keeping the water hot 24-7. So we could schedule it, right? We don't use hot water between 9 and 8 a.m., 9 p.m. and 8 a.m., Oh, absolutely. And actually, the calculations that I sent you was not keeping the water hot. It's actually only during. So hot water heaters are rated two different ways. One is what the static um, temperature is. And then two is the in use. And the calculations I came up with was the hot water heater actually only running about two and a half hours a day. Okay. Over okay. a 24 hour period. So it's not hot water heaters don't burn continuously, even though a lot of people think they do even a gas one only will cycle for a short period of time during the day when there's demand for it so it's it's one of those things where that's actually put into the calculation if it was using a 24-hour draw you'd probably need about 10 times the number of panels that you need to tell you how inefficient electric heat is when it comes to heating water hmm, fascinating so will is that a what i would call a traditional electric water heater that has two or three electric heating rods that are in the tank or is that a heat pump uh domestic water heater so i looked at two i didn't look at heat pump but i looked at on-demand electric because actually i'm using an on-demand electric water heater in one of our in-floor heat systems and yeah. then i also looked at um a domestic hot water heater the interesting thing about the regular domestic 30 gallon hot water heater is you actually get a little bit better usage out of the domestic one. And the only reason why is because that water becomes a heat sink. And once it gets heated up, it 
holds that temperature if the water heater if you buy a better one that has an insulated tank that thermal mass actually holds longer which makes the burn times less versus an on-demand where it burns all the time because when you have demand it goes so if you have a regular household with four people in it it's going to run more cycles versus the large water heater which only cycles when the temperature needs to be because i have uh a good friend of mine who's a contractor who installed the heat pump water heater. And that is next on my list of moving away from uh, gas is the heat pump water heater because it, it uses quite a bit. I don't have the number in front of me, but versus a traditional hot water heater, it uses quite a bit less um, energy. And the guy, the guy, the plumber on this old house, Mr. Trethaway, is a big advocate of these as well. So I'm, I don't have the numbers in front of me, unfortunately, but it's, well, I think it's the significant savings. It's four times. The one I was looking at is four times as efficient as a regular one. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what made it qualify for the federal rebate that w- we have a federal rebate. That would be like $600 on one of those and a state rebate. I live in DC, which would be $300. So you'd get $900 back from the cost of the unit. Now, there's a couple of things I've run into talking to electricians. One is you have to have enough height because they're taller than a regular hot water heater because they have um, the heat pump on top of it. Yep. And apparently you have to have a plug-in to plug it in right by the hot water heater to plug they, in the heat pump. You need 240 at, um, I don't know, maybe 30 amps. I mean, Will could speak to that. But the, my buddy has one, and he is in a garden floor of a row house in Brooklyn, and those are short ceilings. And he, I, don't, I could ask him what the height of the thing is, but he got this thing down the stairs and upright in a smaller building. So, okay. I mean, maybe they make taller ones too, yeah, but um, I, I don't see that as a red flag for me at least. And running... Maybe the plumber didn't want to do it. Maybe he's trying to dance away from it. But running a 240 volt line to where the heat pump is going to be is is not rocket science. Okay. Let me ask one quick question. You guys maybe are using a term that I'm not familiar with. Heat pump. I know heat pump uh, technology from heating and cooling, like for air conditioning and mini splits and that. Explain to me how a hot water heater that's a heat pump works, Eric, if you could. It's it's basically the same thing as your mini split, except instead of uh, a fan blowing air across the coils, there's a heat exchanger. So your domestic water is going through a heat exchanger with the coil from the heat pump. And if the heat pump can't pull enough hot air or heat from the surrounding environment in your basement, it has an electric coil assist to bring the water up to the 120 degrees or whatever num- uh, number you want. But it is a substantial savings from a traditional electric domestic hot water heater. I'm, I'm wondering because it's using the, you know, to get the first ambient temperature of that liquid up to, you know, kind of the cruising altitude, and then it's using electric to kind of carry it the rest of the way. Because I know a heat pump will only bring the temperature up to a certain point. And yep. just like a heat pump will only work down to a certain point, it'll only work up to a certain point. I'm wondering then if they're, you know, getting 75% of the way there with the heat pump and then doing the last 25% with the electric assist. That it could very right. well be. I mean, Con, Con Edison, this is the New York uh, supplier, is every other month they send me an email. I mean, a, a printed thing about converting to a heat pump water heater and that there's rebates and they'll help me find a contractor. So it's, um, it's becoming like an everyday thing, at least, at least uh, in the New York area. Interesting. So it's also interesting. So I've talked to a number of plumbers about doing this because I'm not as handy as you guys. Um, The cost from, I've got two more plumbers coming, but the first plumber, it was, he was going to charge me $2,900 to install it, to bring the hot water heater and install it. So that that's a regular hot water heater that's electric. And he wasn't going to do any of the electric 
moving around, you know, the plug in or any of that stuff. I need to get my electrician to do that. Right. And then I asked him about the heat pump one and he said it would be double. I got to become a plumber in DC. Holy cow. That's good. That doesn't Arjun. sound right. That really doesn't well, sound but right. What you just said, Eric, I think is right. Is he might be trying to dance away from doing it. He might not want to do it. Yeah. I, well, I mean, yeah, what I, when I was a contractor, I didn't want to do a job. I just made it really expensive. <laughs> and then, well, I mean, to go through the math, they would say yes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so to swap out a water heater, I mean, let's just get into the nitty gritty of this. First off, an electric water heater is the simplest of all of the devices to swap out. If you have a current electric water heater, literally you're unplugging an appliance, cutting two lines, putting a new water heater in, splicing the lines back together, you're back in business. I I would think that labor on something like that would be five, $600 and you can get from either the orange store or your local hardware store, an electric water heater start out at six hundred dollars and go up to nine hundred dollars so i mean well price should be probably like fifteen hundred bucks to have a water heater swapped and if you had to have the electric brought in probably be a three or four hundred dollars depending on where the electric is in your house so we have gas right now so i need them to cap off the gas or whatever it is they have to do to that and i mean it's not far i would say that our electric panel from our hot water heater it's in view which i guess is code and it's about um 12 feet away oh that's see that's nothing to cap that's off nothing. the gas is 10 minutes it's a five dollar okay. part <laughs> okay you turn okay. off the gas unscrew the thread if it's a crimp connection you put that on if it's a flared connection you just flare it if it's a screw on connection you literally put the tape on and screw the cap on i wonder does the uh does this oh so this is a federal and and dc grant program so maybe they in in the in the program information, do they happen to have some suggested installers? Yes, you have to use their their list of installers. So that's what the list I was going off of. We oh, had, interesting. When we moved in, we had to change our electric panel. So I called the same company that had done our original work, just because I theoretically thought they would know the panel and have the information. Of course, yeah. they told me they their system died in 2014 or something. Oh. So they don't have any old information. So yeah, I've got to get I've got to get a couple more quotes from the electrician because that they, the electrician said it was uh six ninety five to to do the electric, which seems like a lot of money. Uh, it probably is about right. I would I would say you probably have one hundred fifty dollars worth of parts, and there's probably four or five hundred dollars worth of labor in there. I mean, okay, it's to roll an electric truck on a job like that. They're they're not really going to be there for very long probably two hours at most mm -hmm. but at the same point on the electric side there's a lot that goes into becoming an electrician just as the same as there's a lot to going into being a plumber i mean if you you're looking to get into you don't want to go to college and you're looking to get into trades plumbers and electricians are in high demand right now and they can charge almost anything they want and people will pay it so it's it's a good business to be in right now i mean if that sounds fine then we're i want to pay people i want to pay people yeah right? it, so it's important to get someone that knows what they're doing as well, the flip side. So I, I yes. just want to emphasize I'm not advocating getting the cheapest price possible. Right, but, right, right. Um, Agreed. When he says six grand for a heat pump water heater, I'm like, that's that's he just doesn't want it. Or the other well, item is they know that there's a nine hundred dollar rebate associated with it. So they're bringing the labor prices up because you're getting an offset of nine hundred dollars and they're trying to pocket the difference. Hmm. Interesting. You know, at the Orange Store, they sell uh, heat pump water heaters in my area, and they have uh, certified installers that will come out and do it. So if the program allows you to buy it from the Orange Store, the Blue Store, um, perhaps it's possible to use one of their recommended installers. So um, we have a ream right now, and That's a that nice is one. what the, yeah, the Orange Store has the ream heat pump one and they do indeed like you said have the installers so i have one i did call them and was like well come and give me a quote it's free to they said it's free to give me a quote yep um but what was interesting was when you change the zip code the cost of the heat pump water heater changes with respect to how much rebate you're getting from the orange store wow <laughs> So they're regionally price optimizing their inventory is what that's called. Yes.
guess what? I'm not going to ask you to become a patron. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do something else, which doesn't cost you any money. Um, it just costs you some blood. Yeah, um, as one of you would consider donating blood. If you've heard the podcast before, I'm a big uh, fanboy of blood donation. Just uh, think about it. Think about if there's something like you feel like you could be doing more in the world for affecting change. This is one way. Um, people need blood to live, and you can change someone's life by doing that. So think about it. Easiest way, redcrossblood.org. They have, uh, you can type in your zip code and find out uh, different places to donate. You can also call or look in the website of your local hospitals. A lot of them have a dedicated donation department, which is actually nicer than the Red, Red Cross. is usually like uh, a mobile thing that is, you know, set up in a town hall or a school or something. And I, I've done that. I do that every summer. I do uh, Red Cross. And then the winters, I donate at the hospital near me. So just think about that. There are some pretty strict rules about who can donate. Uh, not everyone may agree with those rules, but they're there for a reason. I mean, we have all these, we have this mistrust of vaccines now. So could you imagine if we had mistrust in the blood supply? Um, so there you go, redcrossblood.org or check your local hospital. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Three days, starting three days before you give blood. I don't, they don't really seem to say that. I mean, they, everyone says, oh, drink a glass of water. And I'm like, no, at least for me, uh, I need to hydrate because that opens up your veins and it makes it work that much better. Plan on going home afterward and uh, resting. Some people can just go right back to work. I cannot. It always kind of knocks me. So there you go. Think about that. Appreciate you that. All right. Back to the show. So let's move on to the idea of replacing the furnace with a heat pump, a heat pump system. I would assume a mini split system, but Will knows more about this part than I do. That is my favorite type of system. I've done six of them so far this year. They are absolutely amazing. And the I come from the DIY side of it. Like our our crew did the install for all the units and and the setup on all of them. And the way they work it's just a dream. I mean, they, it, as long as the, the, the only caveat that you're going to run into in DC, and it was the question I asked earlier was how cold does cold get? Because there is a stopping point on a mini split on the way down for temperature. When it gets super, super cold, the unit may not run. Oh. So that's the big question is, is what temperature does it get to? Cause like if you live in, you know, Oklahoma and it gets to 30 degrees outside one or two days perfect system for you if you live in northern Wisconsin we have three season cabins that I put them in that when it's 30 below outside nobody's staying in the cabin anyway so it doesn't matter we just use the air conditioning during the summer and then in the shoulder months of May and September when it gets a little cold at night the heat pump kicks in and easily heats the space I can't remember the number and it depends on the unit that you buy like a Mitsubishi or one of those tend to go a little bit deeper, but once you get to a certain ambient temperature outside, the heat pump will not continue to bring the temperature in because it doesn't have it to pull. So that's the only thing you have to look at on, on those systems. The other thing to think about, uh, by the way, I have many heat pump mini splits in my house in Brooklyn, and this winter I'm going to rely on them more instead of uh, steam heat. But how, Nicole, how well insulated is your house? Because once in the winter you warm up your house, if it gets really cold and the heat pumps aren't pumping out as much or a higher temperature heat, the, the building has a physical thermal bank of energy, so it will keep it warm. Do you have, do you have good insulation? Yeah, so our house was built in 1912 and then flipped in uh, 20, gosh, 2014, I guess. So... Yeah, they did do, they did insulate the home. However, after we moved in, we participated in, DC has another program to improve your, did you guys call it the R rating or something, of the yeah. house. And we had, 
the city put five thousand dollars more insulation up in our in our roof, which was great. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was really nice. So um, I think it's pretty well insulated. So yeah, it does stay warm, right? Like I, I, I have the nest, and I really don't like to pay for <laughs> heat, and so um, I have it set to sixty six at night. I don't know what you guys keep yours at, but my That's husband's fine. Like, it's a little 85. bit, but it doesn't even, yeah, the heat doesn't even seem to turn on until the morning. So I feel like that's pretty good. 66. That is, that is. Wow, that's cold. Sorry. <laughs> Jeez. Well, we've got blankets. So well, <laughs> well, in your in your personal home, what, what kind of heating do you have? Um, actually, I have uh, three types of heat. Uh, the, the biggest one for us is we have a wood boiler system outside um, that, you know, heats up whatever you know we throw in it and then the liquid pumps into the floor and into the furnaces and everything like that like our we last year i think i used a half a tank of propane total for the whole winter so i mean we use wood heat for a part of it and then propane as a backup and then we have forced air and then a heat pump also so i i have multiple systems inside of this house and the other houses it's all propane and natural gas uh forced air heating nice. systems i have a little of so- everything I wanted to go off on a little tangent here because I'm talking with my neighbor uh, about solar and we, we worked with a solar installer in Brooklyn and they, it was, uh, you know, we wrote one check and everything was taken care of all the permitting, the dealing with Con Ed, the installation. And we got LG 300 or 350 watt, I think panels. I have 15 panels on an array and it's on a canopy. It's beautiful. And it was quite expensive, but we got a lot of tax breaks for it. But my friend pointed out, my neighbor friend, he said, you know, if you want to put solar on your roof, you can also do it DIY. And there are several sites plus these entrepreneurs that are selling, uh, you know, when you buy, you know, when you buy Carhartt, you can buy a brand new Carhartt, but there's a couple stores that sell the, what are they called? Seconds, factory seconds or. Yep. We're like the stitching is a little off. Okay. That it, it's called B stock. Right. So that's the same thing in the solar world. So there are these guys that liquidate uh, solar panels that might, the silicon might be a little wavy or it has a dent in the side. And also, believe it or not, there are solar panel repossessions where people have taken out a loan to pay for a solar install and they don't pay the loan. So pe- the bank takes the solar panels back off the roof. So there are, in addition to a soup to nuts installer, you can DIY this at a substantial savings with the panels. Huh. I've, I've read about some of the companies that sell the uh, B stock. The only item that you need to look at also on the B stock, and this is pretty important, is if there's damage to the panels to see if there's any damage to the field where the, the actual cells are because if there's even the slightest of cracks in them, that it drops the efficiency rating significantly. So the one thing to ask is, are these damaged? Are they B stock? Like what what channel do they come from? Because in some areas, there are situations, because I read a lot about this because we were looking at buying a whole pallet of solar panels and come to find out that they were ones that were dropped with the forklift or something along those lines. And they actually fell into C stock, but the guy was selling them as B stock. So you do have to be buyer beware slightly on the uh, if the panels seem too cheap to be um, real, to be true. Yeah, you might want to check into it because there are a number of people who are selling damaged panels that would be considered refurbished as B stock panels, which is not the same thing. Well, and, and I know. Is, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sure. In D.C., if you don't go through some solar installer, the city won't give you your permits. Oh, interesting little different than northwest wisconsin how well boy they really got you locked up there i I built an entire building and we're gonna have the inspect i have like two inspections tomorrow on it literally we went from nothing to a building in less than 10 days and there is no red tape at all i mean granted we built everything to code but wow you got to use all these different guys they really got you locked in there (laughs) that east coast those people yeah (laughs) (laughs) by the way the The one website I looked at that has discount solar panels, it's called jaysenergy.wixsite.com, J-A-Y-S, energy, 
www.wixsite.com. And super simple site. He's like, I got a pallet of these. I got a pallet of these. I got six pallets of this. And this is the price, <laughs> which I kind of liked, you know. If you know what you're looking for, that's the best way to go. You just got to ask the right questions when you go pick them up. Yeah. And then um, I'll put in the notes here, but Nicole has two articles that I read that got us started on this one on Medium called Comparison Shop When Going Solar. And also this very interesting deep dive article from a, is it, I guess it's called the website put out by the Yale University called E360. Um, if you want to Google, it, it's called From Homes to Cars, It's Now Time to Electrify Everything. So was that the article that kind of triggered this conversation, Nicole? Yeah, I would definitely say I, there was some, something else in the new. Oh, you know what it was? It was the president going over to, to Europe without a, a bill in hand, <laughs> telling everybody we're going to we're going to be environmentally friendly in America, but our Congress won't pass a bill. The climate change um, bill, yeah. Right, right, right. So, um, I mean, the next the next thing on their list is my um, gas stove. Right. And I have some experience with induction cooktops, so uh, we could talk about that. We're almost done with our regular show. We're going to go into our after show for patrons, but I did want to touch on the induction cooktop. Will, yeah. have you any experience with those? I have no experience at all. We burn the fossil fuels and throw oil on the fire and just cook and cook and cook. So unfortunately, I don't know about these fancy cooking tools you guys got on the East Coast. <laughs> well, on the East Coast here, we got these fancy tools. <laughs> it is essentially a flat piece, piece of glass. And there are what are called induction coils underneath. And if you put a metal pan on them, like a cast iron pan, it has to be a flat. If your cast iron's warped, it doesn't work nearly as well. You can also use other metal pans, not just cast iron, but you know me. And you apply power to the induction coil, which is like a regular knob, just like any kind of gas or electric stove. It will heat up that pot wicked fast. And it is a based, it uses electricity. And the beauty is uh, when you turn it off and you take the pot off, that glass top is warm, but not boiling hot that you know that you can get a third degree burn you you shouldn't touch it right away and it the efficiency is much higher than a regular electric stove with the coils which are you know they got the glowing coils that glow and heat up the other cool thing is that at least here in new york there are a couple of green recyclers that have storefronts and there are contractors by the way, those storefronts are nonprofits. So contractors are gutting a kitchen and they pull out a cooktop, an induction cooktop from the previous fancy client. They will take it to the green recycler. They get a tax break, a tax deduction for donating it. And then you can go into these stores and buy an induction cooktop that might have a couple nicks on it, but it's half the price of a new one. And obviously I really like them. <laughs> so... Can I ask a question, Eric, about the induction cooktops? Is it one of those where, you know, you go to the orange store and they have a four burner electric stove with a, you know, oven underneath? Is there just like a second version of those types of stoves that's completely induction? Or is it like its own unit that you have to do? Like, can a person just go and buy one, slide out their stove and put another one in? Or do you have to buy something else to get it all to work? They have both. They have induction cooktops built into a traditional stove. The ones that I see most are drop-ins onto like a kitchen island or a drop-in in, into a counter. Interesting. And you They're don't like have to get special pans. like the size of a flat suitcase and you just drop it in. And, and you don't have to have special pans or anything like that to do this. You could take any pan and go go to town? Any metal pan. I, I don't quote me on this. I think it's aluminum that doesn't work or one of the pans doesn't work. But regular metal pans and cast iron pans work great. Interesting. Hmm. Nicole, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I need, we have a fancy Italian mini stovetop, I would say, um, that the, you know, the contractor put in. Um, and so maybe, but the, I guess I'd have to get electricity to that, right? You have to have. Yep. Okay. I mean, that could be, we would probably do that before the HVAC, honestly. 
Right, and it, it is not rocket science to run that wire. Again, it would it would have to go from your basement up into a wall. But it's again, it's a, it's it's ideally a two hundred and forty volt line, which means the wire is a little thicker. But as long as you have room in your electric panel, and if it was the house was flipped, I would think they upgraded the panel to like a big hundred amp panel. There's room in the panel, and it's very doable. And you would not once it's in, you don't really think about oh, it's an induction instead of an electric heating coil one. It's just, and the beauty is you can buy little portable ones. So when I cook in the backyard in Brooklyn, I've made a couple of videos, I think, about this. I literally plug it into, it's just got a skinny regular 120 volt cord that goes into my outdoor outlet. And I can, you can cook pasta, you can make chili, you can make curry, you could cook a steak. It's, it's amazing. And those things are like $65 from Amazon. Hey, so, well, in, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, Brent can't, my husband can't stand our gas stove anyway, because it's flaky. It's it's Italian. <laughs> ah, not going to touch that. We have um, some so listeners that's actually in Italy. really interesting. That's really interesting. So, Eric, can I give you a homework assignment? Um, sure. I think, I think you have one of these. Do you have a kilowatt? You know what I'm talking yes. about, right? Yes. Can you fire up your induction? So, I went on this whole rant of trying to figure out how much power, let's say the Instapot works versus the coffee pot versus all these appliances in our house to figure out what we could use out at, let's say, Pinecone Camp, because I got to count every single ounce of electricity we use very carefully. Yeah. I'm curious how much power does boiling a pot of, of water, let's say, on the induction use? Like how many kilowatts of power or watts of power does it use? Maybe p- plug that in one time and just see, because it'd be interesting to see how much energy it's actually producing because then you could equate it to well if i had a solar panel this size i could run this induction cooktop indefinitely you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like to figure out what the calculation of that is because having that little device and going around your house it's amazing to figure out what's actually drawing the power in the house and things you wouldn't traditionally think would be all of a sudden become um, items that you could potentially look at wow yeah i'll do that i'll do that it's um it's it's I love it because like when I cook fish, I don't I don't have a vented kitchen hood in my apartment. And so I'll cook the fish in the backyard and then we can have some fish for dinner. But my apartment doesn't smell like fish for three days. So that's what I love about the little portable induction cooktop. I've also melted uh, beeswax from the beehives with it. So that it's got wax. All, it's all stuck with wax and stuff. It's kind of a mess. But you, you could they're go really up. great for little outdoor cookers. One other thing about the natural gas is that it is contributing to poor indoor air quality as well, which we don't yes. think about. But apparently, it's in, it's really a big, it's really bad. That is a thing that people don't know about. That that, that is really is a thing. Wow, we'll have to talk about that in the uh, after show because I've got some comments on that. All right. <laughs> so, everyone, um, I know this was a deep dive on converting electric, but we're going to talk more about this. I I'm a solar fanboy, and I think the three of us are probably solar fan people. Um, that's a weird word, solar fan. Like we like solar fans. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Eric, I think you should build the induction cooktop maple syrup evaporator that runs off a solar panel. There oh, you go. Wow, I'd never thought of that. You have to make a video. There you go. When you're internet wow. famous, call me, please. All right, cool. So any thoughts, you guys? It's radio at gardenfork.tv. If you would consider becoming a patron of the show, there's information about that in the show notes. And more information about Will and Nicole, you want to see what their world is about. And um, I I think that's it. Is that it, guys? Yeah. All right, we're going to go on to the after show. We're going to talk about some deep secrets of Eric and uh, make it a great day. We'll see you next week. All right. Garden Fork Radio is produced in Brooklyn, New York by Garden Fork Media, LLC. Our executive producer is Jimmy Gooch. You can learn more about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. The music for our show is licensed from audioblocks.com and uniquetracks.com. Music.